Okay, today we are going through Reinforcement Learning, an Introduction, Second Edition by Sutton and Bartow. And we're starting with Chapter 2, going through 2.1 through 2.4. So in, in this first part of the chapter, they introduce the bandit problem. <clears throat> and the bandit problem is a canonical example in Reinforcement Learning, and it, it's very simple because it frequently has no state. So you are basically an agent right here. Um, and there's a, an, a, an arbitrary number of levers that you can pull. And so you just pull a level and you get a lever and you get a reward. And so this is the K armed bandit problem. There's um, any K number of levers. And so you could, you know, pull this lever, you'll get a numerical reward signal. So you choose an action to pull this lever, you get a reward back, and you can do that for any K of the levers. <clears throat> and so in this um, chapter, they represent the K-armed bandit problem as a 10-armed bandit problem. And each of the rewards uh, is assigned a certain value. And when you sample it, or when you choose that action, the reward signal will look something like this, specifically a Gaussian distribution, um, where the probability is centered around a mean of zero and the variance is one. And so in this uh, version of the K-armed bandit problem, there's, a, there's uncertainty in the actual reward signal you don't just pull the lever and immediately know what the reward is because you might have gotten lucky and gotten sort of on the low end of the reward signal and so this is sort of uh, what they're visualizing in figure 2.1 and so in order to choose the right action uh, in order to solve this problem what we want is we want to be able to figure out what the expected reward is. And so in order to figure out the expected reward, or as is commonly written, Q, um, the expected reward of a given action, this is just a notation used for it, we want to find the probability of that action, or of that reward signal, multiplied by the reward signal. That's just the definition of expectation value. Um, and so if we have this, then we can know what the best action is at all times, because we simply choose the one with the best expected reward. And so if this um, was a deterministic sort of environment, i.e. if we just pull the lever and we get a reward of whatever the actual reward is, then this probability would um, always be one. But in this case, it is not deterministic. There is that Gaussian interference. And so we have to approximate this since we, you know, unless we have infinitely many samples, we can't exactly get this right. And so in order to do that, they rely, we rely on um, action value methods to estimate this Q value. And so here we're writing big Q because it is an estimate at, after a certain number of iterations. And so what we want basically is just the average reward at that point. That is our for that action. And so we want basically the sum of the rewards by given that action and over the number of times we've taken these rewards, or taken this action, I should say. And so this is all based on a certain action being taken. And this is, as we sample this many, many times, this will eventually go to the correct evaluation. Uh, this is the law of large numbers. As we just keep sampling, this will approximate the correct 
evaluation. And so in order to get to this point, however, we have a important decision to make. And that is when we are very far from the law of large numbers, when we've only sampled once or twice, how should we go about picking an action? If we have, you know, 10 levers to pick and we initialize them all to zero because we don't know what a reward is, and we get a reward of negative two for the first lever, we have the levers here and we're picking them, we get a reward of negative two for the first one, then for the second one we get a reward of 0 0.3, the rest are zero, so do we just take the 0 0.3 or do we keep investigating and even once we have values for all of them, this is a 0 0.7, 0 0.8, should we always pick this one? Because there is this, you know, probability that maybe this one is actually the higher reward because this was just a low probability event. And so in order to decide how, when to pick what we think is the optimum value and when to explore and choose other values, the so-called exploration versus exploitation trade-off, we use the so-called epsilon greedy technique. And so this determines when we should explore, i.e. take an action that we do not think is best, because if we just choose the best action every time, we would maybe never explore the better action, get stuck in a sort of local minima, versus when to exploit and choose what we know or what we think we know is the best action. And so this is very simple and can be ineffective for more complex domains. But basically, we say we give epsilon a, prob a, a value and we say if we, you know, if we pick a random number and if this number is lower than epsilon, then we say, okay, we'll exploit. And if, if we say, oh, it's bigger, then we explore. So we might say, Okay, set it to 0 0.01. So that basically means there's a 1% chance of taking a random action. And this means that there's a 99% chance of taking a exploitative action or what we think is the correct answer. And so this is a really common um, technique even used to some extent in modern uh, deep reinforcement learning with the likes of the DQN sort of papers all rely on epsilon greedy for exploration. And so really the last uh, problem we have going on here is how do we do this in code? Because this is pretty straightforward. Um, you just have to, you know, pull the levers, average the reward for each of these actions. I should specify that this process or this Q value applies to every single one of these. So how do we go about coding this? Because if we have these very large, you know, arrays that we're keeping track of everything in, we don't want to have excess memory or lookup time consumption. We want a sort of dynamic approach or an incremental approach to improving it. And so we can just follow the derivation they provide a derivation of how to do this incrementally. And so we know that at any given time t plus one, because we're looking ahead, this is incremental, remember, given that um, we've taken, there's been t time steps so far. This is the, you know, the average so far, um, as we can see, oops, sorry. Um, this is exactly the formula as I wrote on the previous slide. And so in this, we can actually expand this out because it's a summation. We can say, okay, let's take this and we can say, okay, this is just um, our T and this is the sum T minus one. And so from here, now we have split it into, you can sort of see where this is going already. This is the approximate for the previous one. And so we can see the sort of incremental nature from here. We can simply 
multiply by one, or I should say a very fancy version of one, which is dt minus one over t minus one. This changes nothing. This is simply one. This is just one, so it has no impact on the actual you know, mathematical nature of it, but it's useful to get to the next step. So once we have that, we can say, hey, wait a second, one over t minus one times this value is the q value for this previous iteration. So we have this q value for time t, because remember, this is one over t, one over t minus one, summed t, summed to t minus one. And so now we have an incremental approach to how to, oh, I forgot to put the t minus one, an incremental approach to how to update this q value. We can continue this process to just make it more concise. We have from the previous slide that this is equal to the one over the total time step reward plus um, my t minus one times the previous q value. We can expand this out. So we have the reward plus, we're just expanding this out to these two. We have t qt minus qt um, from which we can simply get, and this is all just uh, following the derivations given on page 31, just explaining it a little more, from which it is, uh, we can just get, writing it here, <clears throat> I should make it more clear where distributing this over all of them, which I'll add an intermediate step here, which they do not add in the textbook, which is, and from there, we can see this is the intermediate step that they don't show, that this is equal to And there we have our final update rule. So we can see that you know, once we initialize them with values, every single time we take a step, we can update our estimate of the Q value. And we can see that as the time step grows or as this T gets bigger and we go more and more iterations, the effect of the Q value of the individual reward on the Q value decreases. And this makes sense, you know, for a hundred million iterations in, we don't want a single you know, result to hugely influence this process. And so that that's really the, the key here. And this is sort of intuitively makes sense. We're taking the error, this is sort of the error term, and that if we had a perfectly correct estimate, then this Q value would equal this R value, and this would be zero. And so this would, we would update by doing nothing at all, because we only have the correct answer. And so this is what we're saying. If the Q value is too small, this is a positive value. And so we're increasing the Q value. If the Q value is too big, then this will be a, a negative um, and this will subtract from the Q value. So we can see how this update rule works. And so now what we're gonna do, well, what I've already done, um, and, and you can find a link to all of this in the description is, encode this, it's pretty trivial to do in Python uh, using NumPy, uh, the OpenAI gem environment, and thanks to uh, a lot of people have implemented uh, the bandits problem in gem, but uh, I use the um, Jesse Cooper's uh, implementation, which I will also um, link in the description. So thanks to him for implementing this uh, environment. 
And so we can see once I, there we go. We can see that in order to get an action, we simply here, the function to get an action takes the cues in the epsilon um, and we say, you know, if we pick a random number, then we simply determine if it is less than the epsilon and if it is, then we pick a random random value or random action. If it's not, then we uh, then we exploit and we choose the best action that we think. Here we can see this is just a helper function to compute averages um, for the graphing function. So we can see k equals 10. Um, so we do, uh, this is for the averaging, um, just so that we go a thousand iterations of this actual um, environment. We, we you know keep stepping and choosing actions for a thousand iterations and then we repeat it as in the book because this is generated to this code is written to reproduce the results in the book um, we run it 2,000 times to get an appropriate average so here we can see there's 10 armed calcium and then there's multiple repeats of the same thing we're just changing the epsilon value and so we can see that we initialize for each you know iteration we initialize to zero and we take the action according to epsilon, we get the reward, we increase, this just keeps track of the number of times we've taken that action, and then we update the Q value exactly according to the equation that we just derived. And this is the exact algorithm as presented on page 32. And so we repeat this process for varying values of epsilon and the figures that they generate in the textbook um, rely on epsilons 0, 0 0.01, and 0 0.1. And I add another one, 0 0.2, to demonstrate that, you know, you may be thinking, wow, we should just, you know, if we know exploitation is not always good and we see that 0 0.1 performs better than 0 0.01, why don't we just keep increasing it? And we can see that there is such a thing as too much um, epsilon. So then we just graph all of the averages and we can see that um, here's two graphs that will appear. And that is on screen, we can see the left one is after 1000. If we just uh, repeat the process 1000 times to get an average, and the one on the right is after 2,000 times. Um, they're saying the same thing. I just uh, find the one on the left a little more clear. And so we can see that this green line, uh, I use the same coloring also in their book, reaches about the same as in figure 2.2 in both cases. Um, but, and we can see that the epsilon of 0 0.1 performs better than the epsilon of 0 0.01. However, the epsilon of 0 0.2, which is not shown in the book, underperforms. So we can see that increasing is not always good. And so um, this is a little, uh, pretty much exactly matches the results of figure 2.2 based on the algorithm, um, a simple banded algorithm on page 32. And so that is the current state of our um, banded, that's the banded algorithm that we're using. And so next time we'll get into more bandit problems, tracking non-stationary problems, upper confidence bounds, and gradient algorithms. But um, for now, this is the intro and yep.